giving you a voice, making it loud our own way. Welcome, Welcome to, to the fun. fun. First updates now, FTC is produced in partnership with the Orange Alliance. Now FTC is a platform to keep up to date on live and archive first tech challenge events and team stats at theorangealliance.org. And by viewers like you. We need your help to keep fun at loud, live, and independent. Help us by visiting our Patreon to pledge your support at patreon.com forward slash first updates now. You can also support fun live on Twitch for a few bucks a month or by linking your Prime account for free and clicking subscribe. Good evening and welcome to FTC Live. Tonight we have an awesome interview with not one, but two world's winning teams from the Rover Ruckus season. We have Steven from our Detroit Winning Alliance first pick, Team 11115 Gluten Free. And we have Baron from our Houston Winning first pick, Team 5064 Aperture Science. Reporting for FTC Live, I'm Ethan. We want your questions. So if you have a question for either of our fantastic guests, please tag at First Updates Now in the chat. We'll do all read the here, and I'm a boss. So to start off, would you guys tell us a little bit, a little bit about your history in FTC and in first? All I'm right, well, first, yeah, sure. Yeah, so for Peter and I, um, we started out in FLL. Uh, I did six years of that, and Peter did five years of that, and we were on a team called uh, Hollis Lightning. Um, and then after Lego League, we moved on to high school, and we couldn't do that anymore. So uh, we went to FTC because we didn't want to join our school's FRC team. Um, so our rookie year was in Velocity Vortex. Uh, we built a really basic Tetrix spot, um, but we got to Worlds, and that's good. So um, and then we moved on to our recovery in River Ruckus eventually. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So I also did a bunch of FLL before I did FTC. I believe it's five years of FLL. I'm not exactly sure. Mm -hmm. And then I started FTC in Cascade Effect, and I've been doing it mm -hmm. for five years now. Interesting, interesting. Very, very nice. So before we jump into our fan submitted questions, Tyler, would you tell our fantastic viewers how they could win a giveaway? Oh. Sorry about that. Yeah, guys. Uh, so we are gonna we are gonna do uh, a, a, just a homemade giveaway uh, right here. So uh, if you can see my screen on here, uh, we got a couple of cool stuff from uh, fun that we have that our uh, friend from Wordplay All Day, Christina Tia, has made. So we got a fun supporter uh, magnet and a fun supporter button. These ones are brand new. Uh, so if you're interested in winning these. All you have to do, click that little follow button up on the screen, uh, and that will be your opportunity to win. We'll have a keyword for you to give away later on during the show or for you to type in for that. Uh, if you do choose to subscribe, we'd love to have your support to help keep fun, live, live, and independent. Uh, go ahead and throw us a free Twitch Prime subscription or for just a few bucks a month. We appreciate it, and we appreciate your support of fun. So keyword coming a little bit later on during the show. Don't forget to ask questions during the show with the at first updates now. Take me in that, and we'll get it into the show doc. Enjoy the show, everybody. All right, make sure you get entered to win one of those fantastic, fun magnets. There we go. So to lead off, could you guys each briefly kind of explain your design process? Um, I know that's something that a lot of teams struggle with and is sticking with something a lot of teams struggle with is sticking with one plan throughout the year. So mm -hmm. Baron, do you want to lead us off with that? Yeah, sure. So at the beginning of the season, our basic goal is we go to a kickoff event in our state and then a lot of our team comes up with instant like ideas or their instant mm -hmm. reactions to the challenge. And so what we mm -hmm. try and do is we'll go back to a room that just is filled with whiteboards. And we'll just spend like a couple hours just drawing all of ideas out on whiteboards mm -hmm. and talking about the pros and cons of each design, what exactly we need to do for the challenge, what exactly, you know, we should avoid. Like this year we thought about, you know, we don't want to drive over the crater wall, we'd rather reach in. So what mechanism do we need to avoid the crater rim and also reach into the crater to get the minerals out? And then it's a lot of like figuring out what we need, then prototyping and eventually deciding what we're going to build. Interesting, interesting. What about you, Stephen? All right, so this year was actually a pretty unique year for us. Um, a lot of you are probably familiar with FTC Sim uh, that we made over the mm -hmm. summer. So our year actually started with us prototyping designs over FTC Sim. 
Um, mm -hmm. And in conjunction with that, we had, or I had a couple CAD prototypes going to see what was really plausible. And then we also had Lego prototypes, and that was one of our main ones, uh, to be honest. That's how we um, or came up with our sorter, mainly. So uh, yeah, that was very early season, probably the first month or so. And then after that, we moved on to an actual like real robot that was built. That was about a month in. Mm -hmm. And then uh, from there, we kind of just play with it, um, see what works, see what doesn't. Mm -hmm. Um, I know one thing my team that we did, like, we kept changing our design, uh, like, pretty drastically throughout the season. Did you guys ever have any cases of this? Or was it just, like, the same design throughout the whole year? This year? Yeah, so actually this year, um, we stuck with the same design for most of the year. Uh, we mm -hmm. had diagonal slides from the very beginning. So that was actually before the, the ruling that said you can't score well in the crater. So the original intent right. of that... Um, was to score while we were in the crater collecting. Um, okay. So mm -hmm. although we didn't change designs, we kind of changed strategies. Would that be like drive into the crater and reach all the way while your robot sitting in the crater? Uh, it was, we'll sit where the robot um, does, like when it's feeding with the angled slides, um, and then also do orbit mode to uh, collect from the crater. Basically our current robot, but being used with the collector at the same time as the lift. Okay, interesting. So yeah, our team changed designs a lot this season. So oh, we okay, started okay, okay. with a rotated arm to <laughs> lift. So we had our standard horizontal drawer slides out into the crater. And then we mm -hmm. had a arm that rotated back to deliver to the lander. And then that was really slow and it was really hard to control. We couldn't really, you know, we weren't able to do any sorting because we couldn't fit a bucket mm -hmm. with a sorter on it because it had to rotate as well. Uh, so we changed to yeah, okay. diagonal slides before states, and that went not so great. And then we changed <laughs> to vertical slides from states to worlds, and that went quite well. And so you rebuilt like five times. <laughs> we rebuilt three times, if you don't count any Jeez. of the rebuilds that we did before we competed with the uh, horizontal slides. Mm -hmm. It Dang, was all lot. to do with not being efficient with delivery. That's all it was. Mm -hmm. It's like, this isn't fast enough. We need more yeah, right. strength. And so, like, in order to support, like, all these rebuilds and, like, the amazing robots you guys build, like, what kind of budget do your teams have? Uh, Steven, you want to start us off? Um, so this year, we actually didn't spend too much. We reused a lot of parts, mm -hmm. um, especially, like, with our Actobotics drive and such. Um, so this year we probably spent around a thousand on robot parts. Okay. 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 Baron. Yeah. Uh, I'm not exactly sure. And that's kind of the point is that mm -hmm. if we want something for the robot, someone will go buy it. Mm -hmm. I'm not exactly sure how it happens. My dad gets annoyed <laughs> at me every time he has to order parts, but the money comes from somewhere. <laughs> We do mm -hmm. get sponsors to sponsor all of our robot parts, but I right. think we, we do reuse a lot of stuff, but we probably mm -hmm. spent, you know, I don't know, $1,200, maybe more this season. Hey, Baron, okay, can okay. you talk about some of the some of the sponsor process? How do you go about getting sponsors to cover the cost of your parts? Because I know a lot of teams out there are struggling to try to get money to do this in the first place. Yeah, so we basically set our sponsorship up a while ago. So a couple seasons ago, I don't know, maybe six or five or four seasons ago, we did a whole lot of sponsorship outreach stuff where we go to local companies around our community and ask mm -hmm. them to sponsor our team and show off the robot, all this stuff. And what we realized is, you know, a lot of the companies, even if they're not engineering companies or technology companies, mm -hmm. uh, because they know us, they know us from our community, They'd be interested in sponsoring us anyway. So we got a lot of sponsorships from local universities, local businesses, and then some, a couple of technology engineering uh, things, especially companies that we had connections with through parents or coaches or mentors. And mm -hmm. we've just basically kept those relationships for uh, like five years now, which have been great. Uh, Steven, one question I have for you. I know, like, especially last year, you guys' robot had a lot of, like, custom plastic pieces. So did you guys, uh, did you guys go for sponsorships with those, or did you just purchase them directly from, like, shops and, like, local businesses? Uh, well, the, the raw plastic we mostly got from Andy Mark um, last okay, okay. year. 
But this year, mm-hmm. our, at our kickoff, they actually had a ton of polycarbonate that we could just buy for zero dollars. Um, <laughs> oh. So that was the entirety of our polycarbonate this year. Yeah. Wow, that's Bye. really cool. <laughs> buy for zero dollars. I'm yeah. Okay. We actually had to sign a sheet to buy it for zero dollars. It was just pretty good. <laughs> oh, did you? That's awesome. Did you take your so, social security credit card as well. <laughs> so Stealth Act, Stealth X fifty one asks, um, can you guys explain the difference between Squirt the Turtle and Holland's Lightning? Oh, I assume okay. Assume those are your FLL teams. Yeah. Well, so Hollis Lightning was. Well, it really starts with Hughes Lightning. In our rookie year, um, uh, Peter and most of the team went to Hollis Upper Elementary School, um, which is Hughes for the acronym. So uh, we were Hughes Lightning because we forgot to make a team name and we needed one in a pinch. Um, And so once most of us graduated from Hollis Upper Elementary School, we went to uh, Hollis Lightning because the name no longer really meant anything. So that's Hollis Lightning. And then... um, once Peter graduated from Lego League and most of the team, um, it was just me because I was the youngest one. So uh, I got two other people from my school, and we became Squirt the Turtle for one year of Lego League. See, you guys have very boring FLO names. Uh, my sister's <laughs> FLO team name is the Chocolate Penguins of Awesomeness. Like, come on. <laughs> oh, that sounds like a high bar to top. Exactly. Let me let me ask you guys something though. Like, this is something that bothers me in FRC a lot. Is that you have some teams that come up with these sometimes over the top ridiculous names, right? And I'm sorry if I'm judging something. Am I more problem to give something to like the uh, five popsicles of doom aromatron, or am I going to give it to you know a team that's got a little bit more serious name to it? Um, so and I understand FL is a little bit different, right? It's a little bit younger age and that sort of thing. But but at the FTC level. Mm-hmm. Do you want to get a little bit more serious with some of your names, or I mean, how do when you look at you know your guys' names for teams, how do you approach something like that? I mean, why not go with the wacky fun name? It's like that's our team. We want to be some fun, very exciting team. We don't want to be you know uh, try to think of a name that's very boring, but a team doesn't have it. Like, I don't know, robot team number one. It's like mm-hmm. okay not interesting i'd rather be you know swift intergalactic space llamas or chocolate <laughs> penguins of awesomeness yeah with our team name i mean the goal was to be like simple and concise and yet you're always going to remember it so since i'm celiac uh gluten-free is really the perfect perfect name because every time you go into a grocery store well there we are <laughs> yeah it gets shortened really well to gf yeah yeah so, um, Sammy Boyo GG G asked for, uh, asked, how did you make your linear slide so fast, uh, Stephen and Baron? Yeah, that is a that is a question I get asked very much. So, I'm assuming they're asking about our scoring lift. Um, our collector extension is ball bearing, so you can basically gear that however fast you want. So, with our mm-hmm. scoring lift, the rev slides, and we basically did three things. Uh, we didn't use the middle screw. Um, that normally mounts it, and that gives it a lot more play. Um, And so to get around that, um, I put separate screws in the actual rev slide that's tapped directly in. Um, So that keeps it from moving around, and yet we still get a lot more play. And so um, since it has a lot more play, we can um, make it move a lot faster. Mm -hmm. Um, And then we also used a a ton of grease, um, white lithium grease. That works pretty well. Mm-hmm. And then finally, we optimize in the software to not move the robot while we're extending the lift. And this is something that um, Peter got down really, really well. And it does really two things. Um, one, since we're not uh, re- doing as many hardware writes to the drivetrain or other motors, uh, we get a lot more updates per second so that the PID for the lift extension uh, c- can be a lot more accurate. Um, and then it also makes it just more stable. It's not wobbling side to side. You can actually see that when the lift retracts sometimes, it comes down really, really slow because it's wobbling and you can see how much play it has. Um, so you can see the importance of making sure the robot does not move while it extends out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we 
we also uh, found a big difference in just dumping a ton of grease onto our slides when we were first uh, testing rev slides because it's like it's stuck it you know won't move and we just like okay how about this grease that we've laying around we just put it on it works so much better oh, interesting interesting yeah we're not as a uh, fancy as this white lithium grease i think we used uh whatever <laughs> super grease that we use for our 3d printer we just use the same mm -hmm. stuff <laughs> I mean, okay, okay. Works. so mm -hmm. what do you guys think the biggest challenge you face this year in both mechanical and programming uh baron you want to lead us off for this one yeah uh i don't feel like the software was the hard part this year i feel like auto was pretty simple and you could do it with very simple movements and get a full auto. It was important to have, you know, a complete auto that worked every time and have it be super reliable, but it wasn't like super difficult programming wise until you do the stuff like that, you know, Peter is doing. Uh, <laughs> so I feel like the challenge was way more hardware focused because yeah, the challenge is really simple. It's just take these two objects and move them to a different spot. But to do it well and competitively, you have to do it so, so fast. And it, mm -hmm. it's all about optimizing every little part of your robot to just be a little bit faster. Like the intake has to pick up the blocks and balls a little bit faster. Has to the slides have to retract this much faster. The delivery has to move up this, you know, it's mm -hmm. always trying to shave off these seconds from all these different things. And building so many different parts, especially for double extend, to like have to shave off weight and you know functions to make right. it go so fast right. it's so different how do you decide yeah. where to cut out time like where are your priorities there do you think uh so the way that we did it is basically we look at videos of other teams and we're like dang that's faster than us now why are they faster than us mm -hmm. and we'll try and like mm -hmm. look at videos of our robot look at videos of their robot with you know mm -hmm. they pick up minerals at like no time they touch the minerals and they have them in their system it takes like right. no effort for them to grab minerals mm -hmm. we should look at a better way to do intake we should look at a faster way to intake minerals uh you know they take so little time to line up and deliver how do they take so little time to line up and deliver we should look at better ways to do that yeah. mm -hmm. so it's a lot of like looking at other teams uh steven what do you think um well so for us the hardest part in software, I mean, I don't really know that much about this, but I can tell you the thing Peter really battled the most based on my observations was update rate. Um, like we started the year off with the modern robotics control system because uh, based on our initial tests a while ago, Rev had a worse update rate. Uh, but then oh. upon testing Rev, um, we found that we could optimize it a lot better to get a better update rate, as well as a couple other problems that um, made it perform better for our application. Um, and then like he also has wrapper classes for the motors so that if the power hasn't changed since the last update, it doesn't make a hardware right. Um, just to save more updates and get even more accuracy on odometry and PIDs and everything like that. Um, mechanically, I would say the hardest part was making our linear slides reliable. Um, our okay. first round of the season in our first scrimmage uh, they said three, two, one, go. Well, we didn't have an auto. So then in, in Teleop, they said three, two, one, go. We extended and our collector extension broke <laughs> and we were just dead for the rest of the match. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, like we redesigned the stringing of our scoring lift from cascade to continuous just so the string wouldn't break. A lot of the pulley system was redesigned multiple times so that it wouldn't come off. Um, so yeah, that, that was a very hard battle throughout the year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, getting those slides to work well and not bind and not de-string and not like get stuck and have enough power to move quickly mm -hmm. and like have enough power to not to not bind it is mm -hmm. difficult it is and that's something that like we struggled with so much as a team we just switched to belt extend <laughs> yeah yep. i know for us like when we were doing our string like eventually we had to like uh, braid it like three times in order to have it not snap like every time we ran so Jeez. yeah um so uh steven what do you think is like on each year's meta that you've seen like in the in the recent years you've competed 
just like a general design that that is good mm-hmm. for every year. Um, yeah. Well, I would say always do Mechanum. Ninety nine percent of the time, that is the best drivetrain. The only questionable year mm-hmm. is Rescue, but even then, you could have pulled off Mechanum. Um, mm-hmm. And then, other than that, you can't really give a meta for every year. I mean, I guess the past three years we've seen like an intake, some sort of pass through mechanism, and then an outtake. Um, but that's just really general. So. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I feel like uh, Mechanum is really good. It's been so strong in the past couple of years. I wonder if First is going to come up with a challenge next year that just purposely screws over Mechanum because they've decided <laughs> that they've seen enough of it. I really hope that's mm-hmm. not the case because Mechanum is so cool and so fun to drive. Mm-hmm. I don't I know mean, if mm-hmm. you think that too, Steven, but I really like driving Mechanum. Differential swerve for the win. <laughs> Ooh, that is really good. Yeah, the drivetrain that's worse at obstacles than Mechanum. <laughs> Differential sort. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But uh, past couple years, I, I can't really... I think that uh, FTT has really come to more of a defining meta as the years go on. Because like, in Cascade Effect, there's like a bunch of different designs. I mean, maybe you could say that Linear Lift was the meta, but mm-hmm. there are all different ways to do Lift for Cascade Effect. Mm-hmm. And then, okay. like... In, in rescue, you started getting, you know, the angled slides, the drawer slides that went out. That got pretty meta. But then, like, Velocity Vortex and Relic Recovery, you know, Velocity Vortex, it was always a flywheel shooter. It was always a catapult. And then Relic, it was always either a front grabber, and then you turn around to place, or it was the dump truck. And then mm-hmm. in, uh, in this year's challenge in River Ruck, is it's a double extender, it's an arm. And I feel like this year's challenge, it's either always a double extender, always uh, an arm. And mm-hmm. it's gotten way more convergent than the previous years have. For sure. So what part on your, about your, your robots do you think was the most unique and why? Um, for us, I would say our, our odometry, um, because we got the suspension mechanism and everything. And we've been developing that for the past few years, so we've gotten it down pretty well. Yep. So our most unique mechanism is is probably our uh, horizontal slides. And not because the slides themselves, they're built just like any other slides, just me, sue me, but because of the way we drive them. So we drive our slides with two continuous loops of time being built so that we can retract, uh, extend and retract just by back driving the timing belt loop mm-hmm. and it works really well and it's a really interesting unique system that almost no other team uses uh, for their slides i'm surprised by it because it worked pretty well for us looking at cool. it it's always like daunting to just like see belts <laughs> ex- realistically for most teams and for me the entire time i was a student at ftc looking at belts was scary <laughs> yeah, and seeing belts extend something is like a mm-hmm. whole nother level. So at the same time as I wish more teams did it, I could see why some don't. It's not really that difficult. You just need to like sit down and think about it and draw a picture. I don't know if it helps for you guys, but for me, it's just drawing a picture. Yep. So that, Tyler, would you like to tell our audience how they can win our giveaway? Remember those first updates now stickers. Yeah, sorry about that. I had myself muted on my own microphone. So, uh, yeah, so we are going to be uh, giving away. Uh, once again, uh, we have a magnet um, from our friends Wordplay All Day. You can check them out at Etsy and make a lot of really cool, uh, mostly FRC stuff, but I think they have a couple FTC things. My favorite, personally, is they have a blue beach towel uh, that's like a blue banner, but it says I tried my best. That's my personal favorite. So go check that out. Uh, and we also have a, a fun pin as well, too, that we'll send out to you. So we call that a fun swag pack. Uh, if you're interested in uh, winning this, all you have to do is make sure you click that little follow button uh, up ahead. And I uh, just typed in the chat. The keyword tonight is going to be gluten science. Gluten science will be your keyword two words uh, for that. I figure I just mix the two, right? Why not? So, uh, so gluten science will be your keyword. So go ahead and type that in the chat right now. We'll uh, draw for that in a few minutes. Uh, and that will get your entry into the swag pack. Good luck, everybody. What's wrong with the aperture free? <laughs> <laughs> aperture free. That that will be the uh, uh, future giveaways potentially. So, uh, okay. All right. So um, 
Baron, I wanted to start with you for this question. Like, how was your championships experience overall for this year and the past years? Uh, this year was really good. Uh, mm-hmm. Obviously, why? Yeah. Because <laughs> we did we performed really well, and we actually overperformed our expectations. Uh, we always have had fun in the past at champs. Unfortunately, we didn't get to go last year, which is very sad. But uh, <laughs> we always went and were decent enough to be in like contention for the uh, alliance selection. But we never mm-hmm. really were able to do much past, you know, semifinals. I don't think we've ever gotten past semifinals. And it was always, like, easily 2 owed, which is unfortunate. Uh, mm-hmm. But we've always gone to champs and had a good time there. But this year was a lot different because we went in knowing that, you know, six weeks before was states. And we didn't have a competitive robot at states. And we were like decent but we really weren't in the spot we wanted to be at and so at worlds it was a lot different to be able to like go there and know that we were in a really solid spot and actually overperform to our expectations because we had uh only done max 18 cycles in practice before Mm -hmm. worlds and then in worlds in a qualification match i did 19 cycles with this sort and no dropped particles wow so it was really awesome this year to be able to go and overperform my expectations and then eventually end up winning. It was a whole lot of mm-hmm. fun. I'm not I'm sure that this is not the normal championship experience, and I know that because you know I've gone in the past and that has not happened, but mm-hmm. it was pretty incredible this year. Right, right. All right, Steven. Um, so for us we had a we had a relatively smooth experience with our robot at least. Um you know, like through qualification rounds, um, we didn't really have too many hard matches. We kind of lucked out with that. Um, mm-hmm. Didn't have any against Dragon Pinion or Lambros or anything. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you guys all missed each other. Yeah. It was yeah. an interesting thing that, you know, I was watching for the uh, the uh, match schedule to come out. And I like immediate mm-hmm. thing. All right. Who's Gluten play? Gluten plays no one. Who's Lambros play? Lambros plays no one. Wait. Cracking gluten land boats are all mutually exclusive. They never play each other. So yeah. they're all going to get through undefeated, and it's just a tie-breaking points thing. Yeah. yeah. And actually, that's that's one thing we looked at. After the match schedule came out, um, we were in our hotel, and the way, or based on how many teams there were, a perfect match schedule that uh, like intermixed everyone would have had um, three undefeated teams total possible. Um, that would be the maximum amount of teams that can go undefeated. But because of the way the mass schedule happened to be set up, there were almost like families of teams that um, never really intermixed. And so that allowed up to eight teams to go undefeated. So three of those dropped out because they lost a match or something. Um, but five of us remained. So that's what that's why I came down to tiebreaker points. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. Easy. I'm undefeated. In a division, like I never, I never thought that you would have such a high number. Yeah. You're undefeated. And, uh, but you're not an alliance captain. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, Stephen, one thing I wanted to ask you guys was like, how does it feel to like break the world record match after match after match in your qualifications? I mean, that must have been amazing. Yeah, that was that was an experience. Um, <laughs> we went into our first match not expecting anything and pulled it off mm-hmm. by one mineral. That was that was <laughs> good. And in our second match, we somehow did it again. And at that point, um, Mark Edelman, who was walking around there, he came to us in our third match and said, well, you know, you've started a trend that's going to be hard to keep up. And <laughs> who would have known? We did it again in our third round. Yeah. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah so it was, it was pretty exciting. So. Hey, guys, something, yeah. something I want to ask you real quick from me, uh, experience – uh, for FTC being both done on uh, Einstein because you're both you're both at either uh, Minute Maid or at, at Ford Field is that correct? Yes. So I, I wanted you to talk a little bit about that experience about being down on the field because you know the FTC field obviously is a bit smaller right and you're down on a football field or a baseball stadium with a small field down there and everybody has to get essentially kind of look at a screen but from your experience being down in the field can you kind of talk about what that experience is like you look up and there's you know 10 20,000 people in the stands kind of watching you play what's that feel like yeah it was a very cool experience it's as soon as you get done with division finals it's kind of a hurry up and wait thing 
because it's all the volunteers mm-hmm. like yelling at you, making sure you're ready to go over, making sure you're ready to put the robot in the car. Mm-hmm. And then you put the robot on the truck and you walk mm-hmm. over and you sit there and it's like, when is our robot going to be here? And they're like, oh, just a couple hours. <laughs> why, why are we rushing around for this then? But we do. Uh, and then we just, we spent the time playing Smash on a Switch <laughs> with the volunteers at Minute Maid. <laughs> uh, so I don't know what the other... Uh, Alliance was doing, but we were definitely being well prepared for the match. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then, that's great. It's very cool to be there in this massive area where there's like a whole bunch of seats and then no one there. And then yeah. a couple <laughs> hours later, there's like so many people there. Can't even mm-hmm. tell how many people are there. So for us, or for me at least, um, you know, like the most stressful time was just waiting, um, especially once people start filling in and the actual ceremony starts. Like there's just so many people and it's so the production value is just so high. Um, mm-hmm. But then once it actually comes down to the round, you kind of just go into like robot mode and you kind of just or, uh, ice everything out. So, I mean, it's stressful, mm-hmm. obviously, but it kind of just feels like a normal run. Yeah, I'd agree. Like people might think that it was difficult with all the people around and all the like big screens and everything i didn't really notice i was really just focused on the match and getting my cycles done i just ran like a normal match i don't think i was the most stressed i feel like the most stressful match was division finals i feel like i was just very content with being you know at minute maid and i was like this will be okay no matter what whereas in division finals i was really pushing so that we could go to the finals match and I was Mm -hmm. just very happy to be there and then you know just got into the zone and just did cycles yeah Yeah. I know from my point of view I sat on the bleachers right beside Ford Field and couldn't see anything so I was like I should have just sat in the stands but it was still it was wild and as a mentor of the team that year I was really proud of watching a team struggle for months and months, try to get something working, and then all of a sudden have some massive success that a lot of them didn't really see coming. So, yeah. Let me see. Um, on average, how much does your team spend working on your robot or the competition in general, like, throughout the season? Well, so for, for Peter and I, it's, it's in our garage. So, you know, we get home, get our homework done, and off we go. So... Um, on weekdays, probably we probably average around maybe four hours a day, three hours a day, and on weekends just the entire day, so like eleven or ten hours. <laughs> yeah, I wonder what the percentage of uh, world winning robots uh, have the robot in the garage because we also have a robot in the garage in, our, in my garage. Mm-hmm. That was pretty important to how we were able to rebuild so many times, so I could just go whenever I wanted to work on it. So officially, we work on our robot six hours a week. Unofficially, it depends on like the competition season. So probably for the first couple of months, it was six hours a week, maybe a little more depending. And then like, oh man, qualifiers are coming up. Oh man, states are coming up. Oh man, and especially between second qualifier to states, which is a three-week period, and then states to worlds, which is a six-week period. That was like nine weeks where I was probably spending, you know, more than 20 hours a week, up to probably like 40 hours a week sometimes, just working on the robot. I was just like, dang, Mm -hmm. I have a plan i have a goal of what i want to accomplish and i just need to mm-hmm. put the time in to get it done mm-hmm. i know 3101 i mean there they're also uh they have the robot in their garage so they have easy access to it and i know jack uh yep. from lane rose a- yeah, does it as well mm-hmm. crack and Pinion, uh, Baron, I, think. I mean you guys were with uh you guys were with cobalt colts do you know about them are they like a school team or what how about uh what about them i don't really know <laughs> we mm-hmm. Uh, a funny story about how we picked Cobot Colt. So people might have mm-hmm. thought that us and Boombots had like a plan. We did not have a plan. Uh, <laughs> we got texted a pick that we should make about two minutes before mm-hmm. we were supposed to make the pick. So I was like, 
the Boombot's coat was already at the uh, Alliance selection area when mm -hmm. it was time, and I was like running to it because I thought I was late to it. I wasn't. I was good, but I was like mm -hmm. getting there in time anyway. And I ran past just a huddle of my team and a whole lot of Boombot's people. I was like, mm -hmm. what's going on? And I was like, who should we pick? Who's a good second pick? I don't know. Weren't you supposed to figure this out by now? And so I was like, okay, just like text one of us when you figure it out. And so we got through the entirety of our division selections before we got texted the team who we were supposed to pick. And it was like, wow. they were texting back and forth. What about this team? No, we don't like their auto. It fails too much. What about this team? <laughs> nope, not that one. And it's like, okay, go back. Okay, I guess. And we quick came up with a pun. It took us like 10 seconds to come up with a good pun, and then we picked them. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that's that good. was the hardest part. It was actually mm -hmm. the easiest part. You'd think it might be difficult to come up with a pun, but like, no, it was like instantaneous. We had like four good <laughs> ideas for 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> that's always the best. I know Steven mentioned Crack and Pin, and, and from, so they're a school team, and the amount that they work like is almost nothing compared to some of the other teams in, that did really yeah. well last year. They're really mm -hmm. incredible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that must they be some a... really efficient. Mm -hmm. It's probably a lot different team dynamic than what mm -hmm. me and Steve are used to. Because it's just for us, okay, go fix you know, this part for eight hours today. But they can't do that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, uh, Baron, did the SAR 3 CAD release come out yet, or is it going to come later? Oh, man. Yeah. I said that I'd do that, and then <laughs> I've, like, worked on it a little bit, but not as much as I should have. Got kind of busy with uh, other stuff. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I've been meaning to do a CAD release of uh, our belt slides, and... The more important part is like an explanation of why we picked it and what it does and how it works. A lot mm -hmm. of teams, like a whole lot of people came up and asked us and had it uh, asked us to demo it to them at World. So we've been meaning to like put all that together and send it out. But I, I've been the one that like should have been doing it and hasn't been doing it. So yeah, <laughs> it has not come out yet. I will do it sometime this summer. I promise. <laughs> So, so you have a question, another question from the chat. Uh, Adri's man, forty three eighteen, and gamers two three three three. Uh, how are you guys preparing for MTI? Do you, are you making any significant design changes, or just kind of leave it the way it is? For us, I mean, we tuned up our auto uh, a couple weeks ago because we had a New Hampshire off season event. Uh, oh, because it did be better, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean. Peter worked on it a bit today, so it's a little more stable, but nothing mechanical is being fixed. Interesting. Yeah. Have you guys been doing like a lot of practicing? No. <laughs> okay. Yep. So I was like planning to do some stuff for MTI, and then it didn't happen. I just didn't touch the robot for a couple of weeks. I eventually actually got one of our. Uh, I got a parent from that used to have a kid on the team to help manufacture side plates. So we have new side plates for our robot. Now the aluminum instead of uh, plastic. So I put those on, mm -hmm. I swapped to Nexus wheels instead of Andy Muck wheels. And then I was like, I should do some stuff and then, nope. So we basically, our robot's just been sitting in my garage for the past couple of weeks and I can't do anything currently because I'm not there. Mm -hmm. Don't have access to the robot, so not much. Mm -hmm. Interesting. All right. So, uh, Fridge Kirby asks, uh, asked, how do you prevent D shafts from slipping in circular hubs? For instance, Actobotics timing pulleys. Uh, don't use circular hubs. Uh, okay. So, that's that's the big one. If you can't do it, don't do it. Circular hubs are the worst. Uh, but if you do have to do circular hubs, which you do have to do for the timing belt pulleys, uh, tighten set screw a lot but don't strip it it's a very fine balance between like it's good and you've broken mm -hmm. it so it's mm -hmm. difficult to mess it up we never really had issues with it like being uh you know getting loose 
every once in a while I just go tighten it like every couple matches. I'd go mm-hmm. tighten the set screws to make sure that we were good, but it never we never really had an issue. If you are having an issue and you're just putting a lot of weight on like one uh round board uh system, mm-hmm. what you can do is either lock tight the uh set screw or another thing that we've uh, done and seen teams do is drill a little indent into the flat side of the D shaft so that when you put the the um, the little screw in it sinks into the shaft a little bit and then it, uh, mm-hmm. the shaft can't rotate even if the screw comes out a little bit interesting I think Steven so, used uh, these too do you have any opinions uh, for us it was just a lot of Loctite and um uh, the Loctite kind of wears out over time, so I made mm-hmm. sure to re-Loctite everything a couple weeks out before Worlds, and then nothing mm-hmm. ever came loose. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, okay. Stealth Act, Stealth X 51 asks, uh, Steven, did you guys ever consider switching your rev slides to something else? Um, well, so actually our, our original design used the mini drawer slides we used from our Relic mechanism last year. Um, it was this really okay. beefy mechanism. But the thing is, with the diagonal slides, I mean, there isn't much on the end. It's not even carrying much weight. So it doesn't make sense to put on all this heavy slide infrastructure. Um, we found that that really just slowed it down in the end. Meanwhile, the really light rev slides, although they have a little bit of friction, with a couple of tricks we did, we got it to a manageable amount, and then we could really drive it fast because we didn't have so much weight overhead. Okay. And uh, Baron, I know you guys said like you went through multiple iterations. Did you guys stick with the same slides throughout, or did you just keep trying different slides? Nope. Uh, nope. So for horizontal slides, for the intake slides, mm-hmm. we decided, or then we did some research, we came up with SAR 340, and we bought okay. six, because we figured mm-hmm. we'll need four but we'll have two extras mm-hmm. in case anything breaks. Uh, and then we started building with four, and then we eventually moved to six. So we used all six original slides that we bought. Uh, and, but we stuck with the same slides for horizontal. We just added more later. Uh, but for vertical, that's a whole different story. For the delivery slides, we originally didn't have any slides, except for we kind of did because we had a rotational system which also extended as it rotated a little bit uh, mm-hmm. and that was with the X-Rail and then okay. we eventually used the X-Rail as in more of a standard state using the X-Rail cascading, no, not cascading, continuous uh, mm-hmm. for angled slides and then you know that was very heavy, it was too bulky, it was unnecessarily mm-hmm. complicated, it could have been lighter and we swapped to the Rev because it was just lighter and simpler and smaller. All right. And uh, Sammy Toothpicks asked, gluten-free, what slides do you guys use for your intake slides? For our intake slides, that's that's probably the second most asked question. Um, we found these uh, aluminum drawer slides from an aerospace surplus seller. Um, they were on eBay, and we snagged them for $15 a piece. So we bought them out. Um, they had eight drawer slides, and we got all of them. So... Interesting. Mm-hmm. That's just like fancy sounding. Some like, like <laughs> drawer slides, you know? Yeah. Ooh. If you use, uh, by the way, make sure if you buy the SAR 340 drawer slides, you're not allowed to use them on weapons. It's in the contract when you sign up for an account to buy me Zoomy slides. You got to be very careful. They specifically state no military purposes. Be careful. All, all right. Be sure to remember that for all of my like, Spring, sprung knife projects? I don't know. <laughs> Fridge Kirby asks, uh, what do you guys think is the best way to tension slide pulleys? So um, I see probably like this string on linear slides. Yeah, so I think, so the way I do it, um, a lot of teams I know like tie a knot, and then it's pretty hard to get it to an exact length. So what I've gotten in the habit of doing is, instead of tying a knot, I actually just take a screw and two washers, and I'll just clamp it between the two washers. Um, and so that makes it so I can really just slide the string to any length and then tension it that way by hand. Otherwise, if you have like an extrusion 
base system, like um, I did this on our diagonal slides, um, one of the pulleys is mounted on the rev channel, so I can just slide that up to whatever position I want to tension it. So we, our solution to that was basically we don't tension that, but because we had a lot of issues with tensioning that, because we had systems that required us to do that, and it just caused such a big problem. So eventually we moved to uh, just having surgical tubing in line for part of the string so that the surgical okay. tubing would tension it and we wouldn't have to like move a pulley or anything. It would just uh, tension it. But before we did that, we did have pretty good success with uh, dynamic tensors. We don't like mm -hmm. just uh, setting the string and then tightening it down without a sort of uh, dynamic tensioner because what we found is how the string wrapped around our like our spool is that it wasn't consistent and it wouldn't stay the same diameter so the string would either get looser or tighter depending on how it was being actuated in the system so we added like dynamic tensioners that would move the pulley it would like pull the pulley based on surgical tubing so that as there was more slack in the system the pulley would move so that you know it would require more distance for the string to actually be pulled, which allowed us to just take up all the slack as soon as it was created. Cool, cool. So Arlen Aso asked uh, to Baron, how did North Carolina states affect your preparation for Worlds? Uh, North Carolina states was a mess. Uh, so <laughs> like for people who don't know, there were three uh, teams on similar caliber. So there's us, Swift, and Wannabe Strange. And mm -hmm. then there was uh, some other teams that were decently good, but I'm pretty sure you could tell that Wannabe Strange, us, and Swift were the best teams there. And mm -hmm. all of us came into it like pretty confident. And then we all like shot ourselves with the foot by losing matches that we shouldn't have lost or having disconnects that we shouldn't have mm -hmm. had. Uh, pulling phone cables out with because we didn't set up our robot correctly and stuff like that. It was a it was a real mess and like it was crazy and that that influenced our preparation for what's really because we were like, dang, we cannot count on anything to happen in fa in our mm -hmm. favor because like that tournament we got pretty unlucky. So <laughs> we really, really tried to build a really solid robot for worlds just so we could solo carry ourselves out of a bad situation. It's a pretty good goal. Um, one last question from the chat. Eddie asks, um, how good are belt slides versus string slides? So belt slides are great because you don't have to tension string, you don't have to manage string spooling, you don't have to like mess with uh, all these different, like what string do you use, all that stuff. It's whole, there's all like, thing that you have to deal with when you have to use string and belt slides mean you mm -hmm. don't have to do it however there are some disadvantages that come with belt slides so mm -hmm. they are some they are weaker i'd say like if you're having to move like a certain a like really heavy load then you may not want to use belt slides because they can slip on the pulleys depending on what you're trying to move and you got to be careful about you know, what kind of timing belts and pulleys you buy because there are better ones that have like deeper teeth that will slip less, but they can still slip, which string won't do when it's found around the pulley. Uh, but belt slides are a lot easier to manage with the, especially the way we do it with cascading where they loop around each other. And I don't know, Tyler, if you have a picture of the way that we did our belt slides. There we go. So we use the same belt slides. So there's just two loops of belt slides between two pulleys and we could extend and retract it using the same slide, which was really nice because we didn't have to deal with, you know, having one extension string, one return string, two spools, all that management stuff. But it does take up a little bit more space because the timing belts are larger and the pulleys are larger and it mm -hmm. cannot move as much weight. But for this year's, we didn't need to move you know, a whole ton of weight. We just needed to move our collection mechanism and two minerals. So it worked a lot better for us. Mm -hmm. 
Interesting. Yes. I like it. I, so we did continuous belts, which is kind of the other way around, and ran into some different issues. So something we used um, MXL, I think, belt. And when we wrapped around and the continuous extension got all the way to the end of the first stage, the belt would actually be wrapped around itself so aggressively that it would like make it so the belt couldn't pass any more belt through that loop and end up binding the slides. So we had to basically put a hard limit about an inch before the end of the first stage. And then it would let the whole slide extend except just rather than just the first stage. So it definitely has its own like tips and tricks you have to like figure out. Um, they're just different than strings. All right. Yeah. So uh, a couple well, or two last questions. Uh, what was your guys' most difficult match this year? Or last question. What was your guys' most difficult match this year? Uh, Baron, you want to start us? Uh, uh, my most stressful match was division finals. Uh, I think it was also our most difficult because it's like, no, this is it. You can't screw it up mm -hmm. now, but here's uh, Swift, who we've we we like talk with a lot because we're both from North Carolina. We both, both talk to each other a lot, and we know that they're really good at Crater, and they're mm -hmm. <clears throat> pretty much on the same level as Boombots. And we also mm -hmm. have uh, Recharge, Overcharge, mm -hmm. dang, who is uh, another strong Crater team who can play really strong defense on Boombots, mm -hmm. and we cannot play a strong defense yeah. on Swift. And so going into it, it seemed a pretty even match, and we weren't sure how it was going to work because of like how defense was going to work. And so mm -hmm. it's like, OK, here we go. Mm -hmm. I mean, re uh, Overcharge's Swerve Drive really came in handy in their defense against Boombots uh, during that match. Yeah. What do you yeah. guys think, Steven? Um, for us, it was probably Division Finals 3. Uh, for one match because, you know, Lambros DC'd in finals one, so we didn't want to run uh, him again because we just didn't want to risk it. Um, so we had to take on Crack and Pinion and Warrior Tech um, with our second pick, and they were plenty good, but, yeah, mm -hmm. it was scary. Yeah, it sure sounds like it. All right, with that, do we want to draw for our giveaway for those those magnets and the button? Magnet and button, yes. Not a sticker, yes. right, Ethan? Yeah, not a sticker. All right. Uh, so the keyword, uh, once again, you have to type in the chat. If you're interested in uh, winning, uh, was, oh, wrong night bot there. There we go. Uh, if you're interested in winning, was gluten science. Don't worry, we'll do the other keyword at a later period of time. Aaron, it's all good. Uh, and uh, with that said, uh, the winner of that, and if you do win, please make sure you shoot at First Updates Now a message, uh, either here or in our Discord at discord.gg forward slash First Updates Now. Uh, and the winner is G-S-Z-C-Z-E-S-Z. -Z -Z -E -Z. I'm sure that actually means something, but uh, congratulations. Oh, oh, it's is who? that you, Steven? Yeah, that, well, that's that's our coach. Well, your coach can win, so that's what you can win, <laughs> yeah. but your, your coach can. So, so clearly, <laughs> though, as uh, Elon has in chat, that is clearly rigged. So lots of rigged emotes uh, in there because that person is a subscriber <laughs> as well, too. So we have clearly rigged it uh, for uh, that person to win. So what's your what's your coach's name? Uh, Gregory. Gregory, congratulations. Make sure you shoot a message out to us uh, so we can get some uh, a couple of little swag pieces out to you. Thanks again, uh, and thanks for watching, everybody. Um, real quick, I'm just going to plug this uh, while I'm on here. Um, as we uh, mentioned coming up, of course, uh, these two teams are looking at both of you guys are going to MTI. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So speaking of which, I don't know how public this is yet, but hell, let's make it public. Uh, MTI is going to be streamed on First Updates Now uh, in a couple of weeks. We're very excited for that. Uh, it, as far as I've been told, it's the first time that it is going to be streamed in general. So uh, so we're going to be providing the stream platform. They're bringing in, uh, from what I hear, a production, uh, professional production crew to help make it happen. So we'll be supporting it remotely and streaming it on our channel as well. So we're very excited for that. Very excited to announce that there is going to be a stream. I uh, can't wait for it. It's going to be fantastic. And uh, to top that, to get the excitement going even more uh, for MTI. It is streaming on fun, by the way. TOA might be uh, hosting our channel, but it is streaming on fun. Uh, so to top that off even more, we are going to do a uh, fantasy draft for MTI. Now, if you uh, haven't been following our fantasy drafts that we do for FRC, they've become very popular. Uh, what they are essentially is that we have – uh, teams that come up uh, and you get the bid for teams. So we're going to be looking for some teams that actually do a live draft uh, two Mondays from now 
Uh, so you'll actually be able to uh, form your own team. We're going to take all the teams. You're going to get a couple hundred uh, fake dollars to uh, bid for teams, uh, and you'll be able to assemble your own set of alliances. And if you're not part of the live teams, we're going to put all those prices out, give you $200, and paying the prices that uh, these live teams have play, uh, play, uh, paid, uh, you'll have an opportunity then to form your own set of teams and we'll uh, judge based off of that. So very cool stuff uh, that we're excited for uh, with MTI coming up. Of course, a fantastic competition. Uh, so if you're interested in that, the live show, once again, will be coming up soon. Uh, if you're interested in actually having a live draft team, uh, make sure you uh, – we'll have some more information out soon, but make sure you check our Discord for that as well too. So lots of cool stuff coming up for FTC uh, and, of course, lots of stuff with FRC as well too, but we want to let you know uh, we still want to keep doing more cool FTC things, and this is definitely one of them. So can't wait uh, for that as well. So go check that out. Once again, our Discord, discord.gg forward slash first updates now. If you have a live draft, do better than I did in the FRC one and don't just pick teams up. <laughs> so thank you guys for all the follows and subscriptions we received today. Don't forget that you can subscribe for free if you or your parents have Amazon Prime. We hope you guys enjoyed this episode of FTC Live. If you want to stay connected with what Fun FTC is doing, Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at FunFTC. And join our, join our Discord through the link in the chat. On behalf of myself, Ethan, Baron, and Steven, and our producer, Tyler, working behind the scenes, I would like to thank you all for tuning in, and goodbye.